Tell me if you're anything like me. I've got this thing where I can't start a new piece of media unless I know it's going to be good, like 100%. For example, like I can't watch anime unless either all my friends are peer pressuring me into watching it and are going to watch it with me, or I know the creator, or I think that the premise and execution looks really, really good, right? Same thing with books, same things with movies, same things with video games, especially video games. Like I have to, it has gotta be, I've gotta have a, a very high bar for if I think I'm gonna enjoy a video game or not. So if you're anything like me, you probably haven't read the world letters of Isaya because you don't know if they're any good. They're not even a book. You might not even like the medium that they're in. And uh, your friends are definitely not peer pressuring you to read them because your friends haven't read them. And don't worry, my friends haven't read them all either. And they're my friends, so. So here's a big summary of all the events of Isaiah so that you don't have to read them. So you can just know what happens. Let's go. All right, well, we'll start with talking about what are the world letters actually. Um, so the world letters of Isaiah are a uh, a series of a, a, a ser it's a serial that's a fantasy political drama about an assassin girl rediscovering her purpose in a life after uh, the loss of her land and lover in the war. Uh, pitch in progress. I I bad at writing copy, uh, but you know it's basically about Arla Star and this is that's my VTuber character right here and uh, how she's coping with the fact that her significant other. Uh, betrayed the country in the war and like she killed all these people for him and like what was the point if he was just going to betray her so you know that whole deal uh it's not actually epistolary despite the term letters uh being in the title it's just that letters got grandfathered in world letters used to be something else that actually were letters now they're not um but it is serial it's serial i just like to describe it as being like fan fiction but original like you know how fanfic is like is typically not always but typically is written like oh, here's like, I'm just writing what I think is interesting right now, and then in the next one I invent and figure out what's going to happen next, and so on and so forth. Like, mm, I feel like at least more so than, and, and then, you know, the performance art is kind of a part of it, like the posting schedule, and sorry, I haven't posted recently sort of thing, and then you, you know, I know that that's not how it all is, but that's how these are written also. So, yeah. It's got that, it's got that fan fiction flavor. Um, for comps, I like to describe it as Violet Evergarden meets Game of Thrones at, in Made in Abyss's world, except it isn't as good as any of those things because those things were made with entire teams and I am one person. And also, it doesn't have music or animation or actors. It's, it's just writing. So it's kind of nothing like any of those things. <laughs> but. Uh, that's 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 a me problem. I don't read because aforementioned, I'm scared things are gonna be bad. Um, and you know, as a whole thing, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, uh, age category wise, it's new adult. So if you're like under the age of eighteen, you know, think about your life choices. Maybe don't. Uh, in content warning wise, we've got death, trauma, abuse, and sexual references. Though I don't show anything on the screen. Um, uh, I will try to warn you before any of these things like pop up very specifically, but the thing is, is that the, the whole premise is that uh, our series lover is already dead, so there's no avoiding that one. That's just in there. So if you if character death would really trigger you, like don't skip this one. But otherwise, uh, I've guess okay. The last thing I guess I'll mention is I've broken up uh, this presentation into three arcs. Uh, arcs are just story arcs. Um, they're kind of like seasons of TV, but except for the fact that they're not pre-planned, so they're all different lengths. And um, and I've broken each part or each arc into multiple parts, but the parts are just like what is currently happening in the story. Um, and it's not they're very arbitrary, and I was not imagining them, so the parts don't have arcs of their own. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all. So just sort of settle in, get yourself a cup of tea, uh, maybe get your Get your needlepoint that you've been meaning to do, do some knitting, do some drawing. Uh, don't watch this video because it's going to be extremely boring if you just stare at the screen the whole time. This honestly should just be a podcast, but I don't make podcasts, so here we are. <laughs> Alrighty. So yeah, let's get to it. Arc 1, The Emperor's Return. Part 1, Before Thule. So Arlisar, our protagonist, 
and Gil, her significant other, we find out, um, actually we don't find out that much about him yet, but basically we know that uh, he just died and she's wandering these ruins up in these snowy mountains that they'd visited. It's like the local equivalent of Christmas. They, they visited them at another one of these Christmassy times. And she's alone now, and she's, like, super sad about that. And then, she, one of the things she notices is that, like, there's this coffin there that is glowing. And it definitely wasn't glowing last time, so... And it's glowing with the rune of opening on it. So, obviously, she opens it. And inside is, like, this brown-skinned guy with dark hair and a sun rune tattooed on his forehead. And his arms and legs are made out of this gold metal that's clearly magical. And he has this, the most magical sword she's ever seen. And she's like, oh my god, who the hell is this guy? And he gets up. He starts trying to talk to her. Uh, she hides because she doesn't know if he's going to, like, attack her or something. She doesn't know what's up. And he, like, tries talking to her. And she realizes she doesn't speak his language. But she does know someone who speaks a lot of languages. So she's, like, walking out to him. And he grabs his sword. And she's like, oh my gosh. But then he hands it to her, and it's very clear he doesn't want to hurt her. So she's like, okay, I'm going to take you to someone who speaks whatever language you're speaking, because I don't know what that is. Um, and so she takes him back down into the city, uh, Sagenheim, which is not her hometown. It's uh, the capital of one of her ally nations. Um, and as she goes down, we sort of find out that um, there was just this big war, and it just ended because of the destruction of Togen or Yer. Now, Togen or Yer as we're about to find out, is basically uh, it was it was a whole island and it blew up. It Someone used the biggest magic spell the world's ever seen and this whole island blew up in a burst of green lightning. Um, and so anyway, she goes in this town uh, and we jump to the perspective of Imvar. Imvar is this bard who's super famous and he has this ship that's like really fast and uh, he's actually not really that talented. He just makes it seem, but he's very good at marketing. So everyone thinks he is. And so she's friends with him. Um, and he's the guy who speaks all the languages. So she brings uh, the, um, the this mysterious man to him. And he and they start talk and they start talking. And Einvar's like, oh my gosh, this guy is speaking in old Novathulian. That's like if, like Shakespeare just came out and was like, yo, I'm talking in Shakespeare time words. And he's like, yo, bro, what, what, what's up? Who are you? And the guy's like, well, I'm the emperor of old Thule. So uh, the emperor of old Thule is like this uh, King Arthur figure. And so they're like, oh my gosh, like that's, that's crazy. Sorry, I'm moving my phone a little bit. They're like, oh, that's crazy. So uh, they start c talking to him and catching him up, and he's definitely not lying because his sword is super magical. Uh, and even if he is, Arliss Air Notes, lying about being the Emperor of Old Thule, it basically doesn't matter because it would be so easy to make the propaganda around him. Like, he looks correct, and he has all the right memories and stuff. Um, so they explained to him that they just, the North, the Allied Northern forces just lost this war to the South because the Philosopher King destroyed Togan Arrière. The Philosopher King is this robot um, who basically can nuke things. And so they surrendered because no, they didn't want any other cities to be nuked. However, um, but the main thing is that people were demoralized. And uh, there's a, an, a prophecy about the, old, the Emperor of Old Thule that when he would return, he would bring about... He has, a, has this, like, sword that's going to bring guaranteed victory, a sword of promised victory, and he's going to bring a world without war. So they're like, I mean, sure, let's give it a shot. Let's go back to fighting. And it's been like two weeks since the war ended. Um, and they technically did the ceasefire and they technically scuttled all their airships. But like, you know, why not? Let's let's see if we can do something. Especially since the sword is super magical and he, mm, he has the power to unite people and he's magical. Maybe he can do something about these nukes. So... But how, And he's like, yes, I swear on my sword, I'm going to protect you all. And Alistair is like, oh my gosh, this guy is so fucking dumb. Because she hates that kind of like heroism propaganda stuff. She basically hates nice people because she doesn't trust them. Um, but she doesn't know that, so it's like it comes across as her just kind of being a dick. 
Um, but mm, basically, uh, she so she she goes into her room and pouts, and Einvar is like, "Hey, why are why are what's up?" And she's like, "He's stupid. I hate him." And he's like, "Is this about Gil? He's not gonna replace Gil." And she's like, "I hate Gil too." Um, she hasn't revealed why, by the way. She hasn't revealed that he betrayed the North because if she does reveal that, um, I, I know I revealed it to you guys, but in the narrative, it's not clear that he betrayed the North yet. It's just clear that he died and that she hates him for some reason, even though up until that point, she loved him. Um, Einvar says something like she values, um, his happiness over her life. Uh, so they have, it, it's kind of strange that she says she hates him now. So she's like, um, yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything, like, go away, leave me alone, and she's like, throws things at him, and he is like, okay, this, this grown-ass young woman is throwing a temper tantrum, and I'm gonna just hold her and make her calm down, and so he does, and she does, and, but she's just having a rough time with it right now, it's very clear. Um, the next morning, she goes downstairs, uh, it's n the first day of the new year, uh, Imvar is making eggs for his crew, um, and this guy, uh, the Emperor, uh, his name's Riev, by the way. Riev is arm wrestling people to show off how cool his metal arms are. Mm, and she sits down, mm, so she's like, okay, I'll fight you too. Uh, just to try to be kind of friendly. And he absolutely demolishes her, basically. Like, she, mm, and she also sort of hints at her fighting style, being that she doesn't, she just... Mm, basically uses a magic spell, she casts like an ice magic spell to make it so that she doesn't feel anything, and then ignores all of her wounds, and just, like, she just relentlessly fights people really fast. And so, um, he sees this, and he is like, okay, cool, whatever, I could just, you know, uh, I, I still have magic arms. But then he lets her win, because he thinks that, like, He's trying to earn her respect. He's going to be traveling with her soon. And she's like, oh, that's kind of nice. Arlisair and Riev uh, sort of bond, and they uh, there's like some symbolism with uh, the upper continent symbolizing hope and stuff. And then they leave Sagenheim to head back to Novathul. Uh, and it's decided that Einvar is going to go to the Demon Lands because he like slept with the wrong guy's daughter or something, and he's pissed off. Uh, so anyway... Uh, Einvar's gonna go get the demon lords to rally around them. Arlisair also doesn't speak demonic, so, like, that's not a good idea for her. And she is gonna go back to Nova Thule and use the, uh, influence of her noble family, of her former noble family, because, um, with, uh, her significant other gone, Gil, with him dead, uh, his father died, like, three years prior due to a heart attack, um, and the, uh, Gil's mother died forever ago in childbirth, so it's just her now, um, and she was never officially adopted into the family, so she's not even certain that people are gonna respect her or, or her claim to power or whatever, but she's pretty sure that they'll respect Riev because they'll take one look at his sword and be like, oh damn, that, that guy is the philosopher, sorry, that guy is the Emperor of Old Thule. So, um, they head off. They head off through the mountains, and something they notice uh, as they're traveling, uh, it's like a two-week travel on these rumatours, uh, they're these llama-like creatures, um, and as they're traveling through these snowy mountains in the middle of winter, um, they notice that all of the bridges are, like, really newly built, um, and uh, this becomes increasingly true as they get closer and closer to Nova Thule until they find um, some... They find the peace delegation from the south uh, building the bridges because apparently a bunch of resistance people took them out and took out the bridges to try to slow them down. And so now they have to rebuild them. Uh, the peace delegation does have guards and stuff because, you know, why wouldn't you? That would be a security risk. And we are introduced to a reoccurring antagonist. Uh, Diakes Prefori, second senator of Telethans. And Diakes Prefori is an extremely belligerent man. Uh, he's, he's not, he's not, he's not that bad. Um, he's described as kind of like a snake oil salesman, um, or not a very trust, like he, like a used car salesman. Like he's smiling and you feel like it's extremely fake, but you don't have enough evidence to prove it. So you're just like, okay, whatever, fuck you, I guess. Um, so... 
Now, Arlisar tries to play it cool and hopes that he doesn't recognize her, but she's extremely recognizable. I mean, look look at her. Look at her. You can look at her right now. Um, she's pretty recognizable. Uh, she has a very specific burn pattern they'd met quite a few times. Um, but Riev is trying to play it cool with her because he doesn't think, he doesn't realize how much uh, the senator knows. So he's like, oh yeah, I, um, uh, this is my sister, haha. Mm, and the senator's like, I didn't realize you had an older brother, Arlisair, and she's like, shit. Uh, so she attacks him, uh, she gets a knife to his neck, um, or, sorry, no, she tries to get a knife to his neck, uh, but she's, like, almost defeated, but not really. Rhea pulls out his sword then, and is like, we're taking, we're, we're leaving, leave us alone, we don't want to fight, and then he gets super mad at her that she killed some people along the way. She does not kill the senator, she kills some of the random guards. Uh, and he just laughs as she leaves, the senator does. Uh, Rhea's super mad. Um, and he's like, you can't just kill people. And she's like, sometimes it's necessary, because that's what she grew up knowing and believing. So she really hates that he's... She sees him as this, like, idealist who doesn't understand how reality works. Um, so anyways, they camp the next night in the shepherd's home, and she has dreams that Gil is alive, actually, and he's coming to get her. And then he, like, stabs her all over again, and she's super sad about that, and it's just really rough. Um, Rhea, and she wakes up, and she finds out that Rhea also actually is having bad dreams. He's having bad dreams about how he was a really shitty father, and uh, how he was too depressed to be a good father, and about how he did his com entire empire that he built immediately fell into a civil war after he took it over, so... Um, and how he was a bad husband and stuff, so they they bond over their past trauma, and she's like, because she sees he actually kind of is like her, and that he's not just like happy go lucky, out of the, out of ignorance, he's doing it, as like a movement of radical hope. She's like, okay, this is more acceptable maybe, um, so. Yeah. Uh, then they arrive in Nova Thule, and this brings us to part two, gathering allies. Um, so she takes him back to her house, and apparently, uh, there are already plans in case everybody died, um, because most of the staff has been laid off, and it's down to, like, a skeleton crew of just, like, the cook and the butler who, and, like, some of the head people, but the larger, um, like, previously, there was, like, all these hitmen who, who always hung out in the house and stuff, and now it's just, like, a couple of people. So we meet the butler, Prones, yes, and, um, he's kind of skeptical of Rhea. But he is supportive of Arlisair, so he's like, okay, Arlisair, if you say that this, you'll want to use this guy as propaganda, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on board. Um, so, yeah, so they, mm, uh, she, since she's back, um, and is, her, like, the announcement that she's going to be taking the mantle of House of Manor of House de Magnia goes out, and the heiress of House de Romanoc, sorry, not the heiress, I mean, she is the heiress, she's head, the char head of it, uh, the head of House de Romanoc, Mm, uh, comes in, and it turns out that she wants peace. Uh, her name is Is Lady Isarala. And Isarala comes over and is like, oh my gosh, Arlisar, I'm so sorry that, um, you know, for your loss that Gil died. Here's a painting of him. And by the way, uh, I'm so glad that you're going to be on my side when the peace delegation comes, because the peace delegation mm, is under threat by a lot of the other nobles who are mad. And Arlisar's like, huh, hmm. <laughs> Uh, so she doesn't say anything to Isarala because Isarala is a genuinely nice person. Uh, she's not just playing games. Isarala is, uh, so House Daramanak is, um, as Arlisar I think explains here, was founded really recently and is built on the backs of, like, it's basically a union. The house is base the noble house is basically just a factory workers union and, um, that has amassed enough money that people respect them. So, yes, and she is the head of this. Um, and so Arlissa respects her as being, like, a genuinely good-hearted person who also has clearly the power to get a noble title. Um, and so uh, she... So Arlissa doesn't, like, you know... She's not mean to her. They're friends. Um, but then she leaves. Um, and she invites Arlissa to this dinner to try to convince um, one of the other houses, Sylvester... Silvestre, or sorry, House de Aramitz, run by Silvestre, um, to pipe down, to stop causing problems, because she's worried that if he 
or one of the other houses is too violent, they're just going to get nuked. So um, Arlisar goes to try to help Isarala, but actually she goes there to see if Sylvester really and House to Armaments really, really is um, against the peace, and it is. And she starts spreading the rumors about how Riov might be more than what he seems. Um, Isarala uh, is like Arlisar and I both think that you need to shut down your forge because you're still making weapons and that's against the peace treaty and he's like ha oh, what are you going to, what are they going to do um so that's kind of funny um so yeah so then Ar so Arlisar goes back home and the next day she starts sparring with Riev and she reflects on her relationship with Gil and how like when they used to spar um they were, it was like a whole language they had around it, and now that's gone. Um, also, another thing she also reflects on is the fact that she's, because, so since she's burned, she actually can't speak that well with her throat. It's really painful for her if she does it for long periods of time. So, um, one of the things she did to get around this is she, they sort of invented a home sign. There's not, there's not a widespread sign language, but she has a home sign with Gil, and he was pretty much the only one who spoke it fluently, and nobody else did. So now that he's gone, she literally has fewer people to talk to, and she's sort of reflecting on that during the sparring match. Um, but she and uh, Riev use the sparring match to prepare to meet Sylvester, and so they mm, they have this whole like dramatic entrance for Sylvester to come in, and mm, Riev's like, "Hello, I am the Emperor of Novothul," and Sylvester's like, "Whoa, for real? No way, dude!" So mm, Sylvester is one hundred percent on board because Sylvester is like. Like, so, you know how, like, conservative people in America are like, I do everything for Jesus Christ, but then sometimes they're, like, hypocritical about it? He is like that, except he's not hypocritical. So when Jesus Christ came in and was like, hello, I am, mm, I am the return of the king, he's like, yes, long live the king, I am at your service now, I will do everything to raise an army for you again. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Um, but then, peace delegation arrives, and, uh, Diakaeus is like, hello, um, as a show of peace, I am taking over this manor. And Arlisar is super mad at him. And he points out to Rio, he's like, hey, Rio, listen, uh, this girl's insane. She's committed so many war crimes. I wouldn't talk to, her. I wouldn't hang out with her. I wouldn't associate with her. You're going to be in big trouble. Um, if you, if she gets in big trouble. So I'd walk away. And Arlisar is like, really pissed at him, the fact that he just took her house, and, like, the last refuge and memories that she had of Gil, she sees him as, like, corrupting them, so she's really mad about this. So, Ilocera goes to stay with Lord Sylvester in Manor de Aramitz, along with Riev, and, uh, she has a little bit of a meltdown, she's not having a good time, so, uh, she goes to her room, and Sylvester actually explains that Arlisar wasn't injured in the war. She was picked up by House de Magnia while she was already a burn victim of one of the biggest dragon storms in uh, in recent history. There has been not a dragon storm recorded that big in a while. Um, and while he's talking to Riv about this, uh, who should come to visit but Lucien de Feltoir. Now, Lucien de Feltoir is the uh, head of House de Feltar, and she comes in, and she's like, oh, what you guys talking about? And she's sort of like the femme fatale trope, but, um, done well, I hope. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, uh, Sylvester's like, oh, you know, we're talking about how great, uh, Rhea is, and how he's the emperor, and Rhea's like, excuse me, you can't just, like, tell people this, hello, wee-woo, um, and she's like, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anyone, he 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 he. And so uh, now we all know that she's going to be on your side, but she's going to be a huge problem while she does it. Uh, meanwhile, um, to, uh, not meanwhile, the next morning, uh, Sylvester and Arlisar go out because Isarala has sent commoners to go mob his forge, like to throw rocks at it, hold a little riot, uh, because it's... Um, it's still running, and it shouldn't be, and it's making guns secretly, even though he's claiming that they're called, they're water pots or whatever. Um, so, uh, she does, Arlisar goes, and then, um, and she murders Catalea, who is the queen of the island that got nuked, Togan Oyer, and, um, uh, 
but she like brutally murders her for no reason because she's helping to lead these common folk into this like riot battle thing and she really didn't need to she could have just like beat her up or something but she kills her because Catalea makes fun of her basically um and or like taunts her saying that she's like not doing the right thing and Arlissa is like no I am it's fine I'll become the monster you want me to be uh, also, cringe at the title of this, Catalea, Queen's Divide Twice. I'm sorry, Sekiro had just come out. I, I, back in the time, it was a private thing. It's fine, don't worry about it, I'll change the name later. Anyway, um, and so, uh, after this, Sylvester's like, Arlisair, what the fuck? You can't just murder people. You can't just murder the heads of state of other countries because they insult you. And so she, what she does is she snaps the leg off of his desk and stomps out of the room. And Rio is like, oh boy, uh, cool, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I was there's not a very well adjusted person. Um, so anyway, uh, Rio then gets to meet uh, House de Feltor, um, along with well, okay, Arlisar first has a little meltdown session in a room where she talks to her butler, uh, Pronsius, who's like. You need to, like, get your shit together, okay? You're the head of the house. You need to dress up. You're going to, uh, you're going to this dinner thing at House de Feltar, and you gotta calm down and get your life together. Um, and so she goes, and Lucienne's kind of mean, but you begin to see a tiny little different side of her, and it's kind of difficult. It's, you get this sort of hint that Lucienne is maybe not an asshole. She just pretends like she is so that, uh, as, like, a defense mechanism, but actually she's trying to take care of Arlisair a little bit. Um, but she, she's still kind of mean. She suggests that Arlisair sh can't drink the cider because she's burned. Arlisair just kind of hates her because of everything that's happened between them in the past. It's not, like, specified here, um, but it becomes apparent later that she and Arlisair were sort of in a weird triad polycule thing with Gil, but it'd be more like to, likely to say that Gil was just kind of cheating on both of them with each other and they both knew about it and were both too insecure to do anything about it so they just kind of let them um but anyway uh really dysfunctional polycule there um it, and uh anyway uh so uh lucien's like cool uh guess who else is coming to my dinner it's diakaeus and diakaeus comes in and is like oh i'm so glad everybody that you're here in peace uh, except you know who sucks Arlisair, mm, who doesn't want peace. I've been hearing a little bit of whispers of this, like, mm, of, like, anti-peace sentiment, and what kind of terrorist would want that? Um, and, uh, so, uh, yeah, so Arlisair manages, mm, um, to, uh, uh, during this pe during this dinner, however, she manages to sort of try to swing public behavior back in her own way. She tries to get uh, Rio to do it, but he's just not paying attention closely enough. She tries to, like, hand sign to him, and he just doesn't know them well enough. So, mm, um, she ends up, and also he just is like, no. Uh, so she goes up and she, mm, uh, uh, offers a toast to a future, um, to a better future, and, like, she, and a toast to Thule, and she's trying to, like, rally, like, nationalist sentiment here to sort of prep the stage for when she goes and has more private talks with all these families later. Um, but she, her throat ends up fucking up in the middle of it because she's, you know, got the burns and stuff. And so, uh, Lucien comes in and tries to save face for her when she's, like, starts coughing like crazy. And since it's a toast, like, she can't just drink early because that's cringe. So Lucien comes in, saves her, finishes up her speech for her, and, uh... And she feels really bad because mm, even though Lucian's helping her, the fact that she needed help makes her house look weak. So, like, it's a whole, like, politics thing. Um, so, anyway, um, at that point, uh, afterwards, uh, Diakaeus comes in and he's like, Hi, uh, I know that we don't get along, um, but let me just, uh, you know, uh, remind you that you probably shouldn't be starting, like, um, starting a civil war or anything, mm, and he tries to be, like, subtle about it a little bit, but he's not being that subtle about it, and he, like, insults her a lot, subtly, kind of, not really, um, and so Riev is like, you seriously have to stop, mm, stop antagonizing Arlisair, and, uh, I'm gonna protect her, like, don't, don't do this, 
And Diakus is like, okay, whatever, buddy. Um, and then uh, she and uh, Rhea are like, they like walk back together. And they, and Arla is like having this moment where she's like, Rhea isn't Gil. He's being like too nice. I don't like this. I don't like how un I, I'm very uncomfortable with the relationship I'm developing with this guy. Um, he tries to offer her his coat, and she's like, "No, go away." Um, and uh, uh, but then they uh, when they go back into the party, however, she can't help but notice uh, that uh, Rio is actually a pretty good negotiator. He talks to a lot of different people really well. Uh, he starts figuring out what the politics and relationships are between people, and she's like, you know what? Maybe this guy is gonna be okay. Like, maybe, maybe it's gonna be, o maybe it's okay that, like, Gil isn't here because this Rio guy actually isn't a complete idiot. So, um, they then plot how they're gonna try to win over Isarala, and they also, um, wanna start stalling the peace talks. Oh, before this, uh, Rhea has this cute little scene where he's singing to the birds, and the birds are singing back to him. And it's like this ongoing symbol that like the bird's still, song still sounds the same after 400 years. It's one of the things that don't change. Because the story is about, you know, like, how things change and how that's sad and how some things never change. Uh, so, like, it's, you know, like a whole symbolic moment and stuff. So, anyway. Um, then, uh, Sil so Sylvester and Arlisair are like, uh, they start... Uh, figuring out who can support them, um, and Rhea is, or, sorry, Sylvester's initially like, well, won't everyone support us? And, uh, Arlo says, like, no, stupid. People are not gonna just support him just because he's the legitimate king. That's dumb. Um, but at the very least, they promise to stall peace talks, um, and, uh, so that they can try to get support for this rebellion, because if the peace talks go smoothly and then they sign stuff in, they can't do anything, I mean, like, legally they can't, and the desire to do stuff will go way down, because it's like, well, we already signed for peace, so, like, let's just stop. And so they have to take advantage of it, of the, like, the fact that we still aren't technically at peace, we just have signed, a, we just, we surrendered, but, like, we could just unsurrender at any point, you know, we haven't signed anything. Um, so, uh, but Arlisar gets mad at the end of this meeting, because she usually does, Lucien probably says something to insult her, um, and uh, Lucien mm, has a quiet moment with, uh, Riev in which she, uh, is, like, Arlis is kind of, like, not doing so good with her relationship since Gil's dead. Uh, she's been really, uh, she's been having a hard time, clearly, since he got back. Um, and, uh, Lucien sort of reveals, this is where Lucien reveals that she also had a relationship with Gil, um, but also, uh, she still also, and she, like, kind of shows her more vulnerable side, but also hot covers it back up. So you kind of get a sense of why people actually like her, because she isn't just a mean girl all the time. She's actually, like, a the pretty, you know, normal person. She just, like, it's mm, her, like, act is just to be uh, really facetious, to try to keep people away from her. Like, that's her sense of humor. That's how she... Um, gets people to not want to get too close to her because she is scared of being emotionally vulnerable. Anyway. Alright, so, peace talks begin. Um, Arlisser, uh, and Lucien and Sylvester work really hard together to make them go, um, get them to start before Diakaeus comes in so that he's not allowed to speak according to court, uh, etiquette, so they, like, push for it to start soon, fast. Um, and then, but Sylvester keeps talking, but then when Diakase does show up with food, hilariously, which is like a huge insult or something, um, uh, Sylvester keeps trying to cock over him and then gets kicked out, um, and Sylvester then picks a guard, fight with the guards outside, but Riev, because he's sitting outside, um, uh, manages to, like, calm them down and be like, okay, everyone just, like, chill, um, and back inside, um, uh, Arlisair, and, uh, Lucien keeps picking, trying to pick a fight with Arlisair, and she's like, what are you doing? Uh, eventually, however, she manages to pick a fight with Isarala instead, and I was like, Sarah's like, oh, you're, so so you're, I'm trying to stall by, like, talking about things, and you're trying to stall by bringing up pointless fights, 
and that's really funny. So uh, then she lets them fight, and um, and uh, it ends with Diakaeus like managing to swing things by taking a dig back at like how dangerous Arlisser is and bringing up the fact she's a literal war criminal. But it's like, whatever. Um, so, anyways. Uh, in the scuffle, by the way, between Riov and the people outside, uh, Riov gets his arms dinged up, and because they're dinged up, they can't work because the East needs to move through them. So Arlisar hammers them back out correctly, and they start talking, and he talks about the past and how he was kind of a bad father, um, and how he doesn't blame his son for trying to take over the kingdom because he was also kind of a bad king. Really, the thing that he did well was he was, like, a good person who had excellent advisors. And, like, he's not stupid, he's just, like... Maybe his propaganda was way better than he was. And, um, Arlisser, uh, Arlisser talks about, um, so Arlisser, because of this vulnerability he has with her, Arlisser finally reveals that Gil wasn't, it wasn't just that he died in battle, it was that he betrayed the North, and to save his face, and to save the faith, the power of his house, uh, and also because she didn't, he didn't really explain to her why he was suddenly trying to kill her, but he did, like, tell her that she needs to fight, like, that's mm, for the North, and to not die, like, that was his, like, command. So she kills him, and not only did she kill him in the past, she, like, stabbed him until he was unrecognizable because she was just so destroyed inside by the fact that he like tried to kill her and then he like his last words were like i love you but not everything is like what it seems and she's like what the fuck does that mean so uh anyway so that was her last act what she reveals to Riov was the last thing she heard from this guy who you know was like raised her and um you know was like like kind of her older brother kind of her ward kind of her uh, you know, his, her superior officer, like, it was, you know, childhood friend, it's very complicated, they have a, their relationship is definitely not, like, healthy, but it isn't on purpose, so, like, don't panic, obviously, if that's, like, a thing for you, you know, maybe don't read it, but, you know, that's, it's definitely what, it, mm, so they have a really complicated relationship, but she did care about him a lot, so it's super traumatic that he's gone, and so that, the way he left, too, now that she's revealed it, it makes it pretty clear that this is why she's, like, so broken up over what's happened here. Um, so anyway, they've bonded a little bit closer. Um, uh, Sylvester just keeps, and the next day Sylvester's still pushing for them to, like, uh, you know, like, move faster. Um, but the peace talks are still going. Um, and, uh, yeah, he and Arlisser, like, butt heads over things. Um, and Arlisser, you know, like, just is, you know, difficult to work with. Um, but yeah, things continue on. Uh, they, they hold, they manage to hold the, the relationship together for now. Um, Rhea briefly encounters Diakaeus on his own, by the way, while he's just, like, sitting outside. And, mm, uh, Diakaeus, like is has been doing some poking around and he reveals that he pretty sure that he knows that uh that Rio Solish is in fact Rio Solish returned and he sings mm, this song about uh the fall of Rio's empire to demonstrate it as he's like walking past he's like humming the, the refrain about how uh Rio died at the battle of Kaleem and so it was not to, he was not successful, and it's sort of a reminder, a warning that, like, don't try anything. So, anyway, nonetheless, um, so Arlisser and Riev, as, uh, proposed, I think, by Sylvester, or as decided at that meeting where Arlisser and Sylvester butt heads, finally go to just talk to Isarala, and they're like, Isarala, listen, uh, Riev is the emperor of Thule, he's like, they're, he's like, prophesied to win, and she's like, we don't need a monarchy. We're like the we we're like not a very good city in the first place. We real what we really need, what we're being promised, is that people can hold power and, and like choose who they want to be their leader. And they're like, well, that's fine and dandy for you because everyone likes you. You're the reason you like you're the people's person. And she's like, yeah. And so 
Anyway, and it turns out that Diacaeus was listening to this whole thing, so he's like, mm, interesting. Um, so then mm, Arlosar and Rhea are like, fuck, he knows for real. Mm, he knows that we're trying to actually start a rebellion. He has evidence now. So they attack him, um, and then they, uh, uh, Arlosar helps them hide down in the, uh, the water pipes that they use to get water around the city in the wintertime. Um, and, uh, they, uh, Arlisar sort of is, like, back at home now that she's, um, in this, like, prowl around the city hunt mode. Uh, so she leaves him back safely. Uh, they have a hu they have another fight about whether they should just kill mm, Isarala because she's, like, betrayed the king or whatever. Um, but I think ultimately they decide, uh, that they shouldn't do that. Um, and, uh, yeah... Uh, oh, they, but they do kick Arlisar from the room because she's being super violent and she's like, I'm not going to just let her live because that's a danger to you. And Rave's like, okay, you get to stay in your room then. You're under house arrest. Congrats. Um, because you can't just kill people. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think Rave opts against it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Um, so she's locked in a room. She and Pronzas, like, talk again about, like, how, uh... There's all this, like, you know, about how she has all this responsibility and stuff. And he reveals to her just a little bit of the info is that um, the imp most important, the, the current plan, basically, is that um, Diacaeus is the only person in the city who has the authorization to just summon the Philosopher King to nuke them. So the most important thing is that they're going to have him killed on the day of the peace signing, or at the very least contained. Um, but otherwise, um, you should, she's not supposed to do anything, she's supposed to stay here and wait and, like, not cause more problems. So, um, we, uh, yeah. Uh, and meanwhile, however, Isarala is trying to convince them to try out peace. So she brings in the princesses, the daughters of Catalea, the, the, the place that got nuked, uh, and she brings them in. Uh, one of them, well, she brings in Fodisha, actually, uh, who is her younger daughter. Her older daughter actually ran off, and we don't know where she is at all. Um, and they're like, oh, look at this poor girl. And she's like, yeah, this city, my city got blown up. Please don't try to blow up Nova Thule. Like, don't fight. Mm, just, like, surrender or whatever. And, um, Rhea, mm, and Rhea's like, Isarela, stop using the what about the children argument. This is so gross. Stop using children in your political moves. Just let children... She's, like, sick. This is fucked up. Don't do this. Um, so, yeah. Oh, uh, that's not great. For so long now, so I think I need to see this up. So basically, after Vodisha shows up, um, Lucien uh, reveals that she's been doing some work behind the scenes with, like, giving wine recommendations to... Uh, to uh, Diacaeus for the peace signing ceremony thingy. So that implies that she's like, you know, being in charge of food and whatnot there. And also that she's spoken to Hadrian de Romanoc, who is uh, a Sorala's younger sister. And um, so she's like, hey, mm, uh, it's going to be cool. I have some backup plans in case we don't uh, make the uh, peace signing stuff work out for us. Hee <laughs> hee. And Rio's like, I don't know that. And she's like, don't worry, I'm not going to get you in trouble. You're going to be fine. You're not going to be harmed at all. Don't worry. Um, so yeah, we get to the day of the peace signing. And uh, like a lot of stuff happens. So um, part one, we come up. We're like, okay, everything's going smoothly. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't even tried to like uh, arrest us or anything. Mm, like, it's good, we're good, and then he's like, actually, he starts doing his little, and Dagus starts giving his little speech, and then he's like, by the way, uh, did you know that your nobles are trying to start a war again? Isn't that kind of cringe? And the people are like, that is kind of cringe, actually. Um, and further, because he actually, he's managed, because he took over Arlisar's, uh, mansion, he has letters that were sent to her mansion from people who, uh, don't, who, like, didn't realize it's been taken over, specifically from Imvar, who was getting the help of the, uh, demon lands, um, and mm, he, like, tries to order for Arlisers to be arrested, um, and so that's not good, uh, so, yeah, the, uh, she runs into the courthouse, um, he sends some people in after her, and she just, she, mm, like, 
drops chandeliers on them uh, and peels back one of uh, their nails and uh, makes them ex tell her uh, what what is Diakaeus planning. Mm, and so uh, he's like, um, sorry, I'm like I'm, I'm reviewing my notes at the same time here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wait, well, give me a second. Um, okay. So, uh, once, mm, hello, so Diakaeus basically only pins the blame on Arlisair for this. Um, and, uh, so, um, uh, so the peace talks keep, the peace signing keep, moves forward, and then, um, and then, uh, they all, like, do their little drink thing, and then, um, Isarala gets poisoned, and she starts, like, coughing, and, like, throwing up or whatever, and Hadrian shouts, oh my god, the senators poisoned my sister. And because mm, Isarala is loved by the people, they, like, start, or like, oh my god, and Sylvester's like, how dare you, senator, you're terrible. And he goes up to attack Diakaeus, but, um, uh, Isarala's, uh, significant other who's here, by the way, uh, his name's Neophel, he becomes more important later, but he's not yet. He's just like, oh my god, I, I see through what you're doing. I see what's happening. And he goes mm, and attacks Hadrian, um, and there's just, like, chaos. Uh, he actually, mm, he, um, Neil actually goes to stab Lucien because he sees what's going, because he's like, I see you, Lucien. These are your fucking wine barrels or whatever. Um, and Rio is like, oh my god, everyone's, like, dying. Um, that's so sad. I'm, I hate violence. I didn't want this. I just wanted like, the North to succeed. Uh, so anyways, um, Arlisair, inside, peeling back fingernails, right? Uh, she's like, dude, how do you, how does Diakaeus contact the Philosopher King? How is he gonna summon him? And he's like, ah, there's, a, like, a phone on the airship, and she's like, okay, I'm gonna go destroy the airship. Um, and so, uh, they, she goes back out of the thing, having killed the people who were sent in there to find her. Um, there's, like, a huge, like, fight that happens, um, uh, Rhea is, people are, like, you know, mobbing the stage or whatever. Arlisair is, you know, protecting Rhea by murdering people, even though he doesn't like it. She does her first time that she's shown you, like, how she, uh, fights aside from, like, you know, pe general people. She, like, sets herself on fire with these, like, gold flames, presumably the same gold flames that come from dragons. And Rhea raises his sword and destroys the airship, and all the Telethenians vanish. There's no body, no crushed corpses, nothing. Um, they're gone. Um, and, uh, and so they're like, well, I guess he didn't, we, the city isn't nuked, so I guess we have to prepare for a siege, um, for whenever the Atticatoria sends people, because they're gone right now, but who knows how much longer we've got. Um, so, yeah, so then, we move into um, part four of Arc One, the Demon Lands. Uh, they start preparing for the siege um, by like recruiting uh, local other lords, getting everyone on one page finally. Um, uh, Riev meets his apprentice, Sigursa. Uh, Sigursa is the missing princess, if you'll recall. She's actually been hiding out at the Chevalier Academy, learning how to become a knight. And she's like, let me be your squire. And he's like, I don't need a squire. And she's like, no, um, I will be a squire. I'll defeat your current squire. And he's like, I I guess Arlisair is like my current squire. So they fight. And she actually manages to draw blood um, because Arlisair, like, knees her, just, like, walks up and, like, knees her in the chest. But this little girl... Um, because of her height, she's gotten really used to people trying, like, people trained in this academy, like, doing all the same moves, so mm, she manages to draw blood from Arlisair because Arlisair, like, knees her in, like, a chest spike that she's hidden under her clothes, so she's like, let me be your, your squire, and he's like, okay, fine. Um, Arlisair goes off to try to find Imvar because, um, by the time he, because in the letter that he sent that Diakaeus read in front of the whole audience that revealed that she was, like, betraying them or was, like, trying to start a war, um, he said that it was, like, gonna be a month, and it's been more than a month, so she needs to go, uh, find him. She goes, she, she and Pronsas go off to meet the other people, the people who've been running the rest of the organization that she hasn't been in touch with, and they're all insane people. They're, uh, she called, uh, I would love to call them the Mafiosos of Madness, uh, because uh, that's such a catchy name. But basically, um, like, one of them is this, like, little girl who, uh, ha 
ate like these east crystals and went crazy and can like make you like see things that aren't there that will like hurt you if you believe in them like these illusions sort of things that she also believes in um but because she can like weasel into people's minds it's like a whole thing um two of them are the first instances we meet of the shahirzani who are um these like spidery people uh from the desert um and they have a demon lawyer also so they're all going they all go off to the demon lands and in the demon lands um Arlisair, uh meets the princess of demons who is or the youngest princess of demons who is this half demon who uh she um she was rescued by Arlisair and Gil from the south at one point because she the, many many years ago the demons besieged the south and the demon king uh pos- did bad things to locals there and um one of them ended up bearing a child uh the who became the demon princess and um but she was not treated very well there because nobody likes demons in the south and so they eventually led her to leave and she has her whole whole own story going on that might become its whole own thing later but anyway so she mm, she and i um are walking around the demon land they're looking for evidence of where um, imar's apparently banished so they're like looking for him and they're like yeah real sorry about that that's kind of awkward uh we all really like you though arlis because of what house de magnia did so you know, we owe you, you brought our sister to us. Oh, and it turns out also the Demon King is dead, and the eldest prince is now about to be coronated. Um, uh, so she goes, looking around for Imvar, she meets all of the different, uh, all the different people, to find, all the different princes and princesses and stuff to figure out what they know. Um, uh, she and Ast- uh, Astero, the youngest demon princess, um, are like, the same age-ish, so they, like, start having kind of a romance thing, and then Arlisa realizes she's just not ready for it because of Gil, so she's like, I'm sorry, I can't do this yet. Um, she also realizes that Astro doesn't really want her, she just wants Gil, and Arlisa this whole time is pretending to, has been, like, trying to act exactly like how she thinks Gil would act, so she realizes that she can't leave like that, and it's just not working. Um, so anyway, um, they start uh, going to, they, so they managed to figure out all, figure out that, um, the princess of demons, uh, kidnapped mm, Imvar and made him vanish, the eldest princess who made Imvar vanish because Diakaeus got her to not trust Arlisair. She and Diakaeus apparently have some kind of relationship, and Diakaeus told her, hey, you can't trust Arlisair, Arlisair is unreliable, she killed Gil, Mm, and so she's like, well, if she's, like, a traitor, maybe she came and assassinated my father or something. Uh, she's just really grief- grief-stricken, so, like, it's not, like, a coherent actual plot. Um, by the way, Demon Land's arc originally was way more uncoherent, and I had to rewrite it, and I still think it needs some more rewriting, but it's okay. Um, so basically it ends with mm, them all figuring out I'm, where Imphar is, her, um, like, you know, reconciling with herself what kind of person she has to be, and, uh, they, she goes through this, like, trial in which she proves she didn't kill the Demon King, and she learns about this person called the Black King, and the Black King is apparently this mysterious entity that people can't remember in the North, because every time they stop seeing him, they forget him, he's, like, cursed for something like that, so anyways, he's like, hey, I'm here, I'm interested in this thing called World Peace, um, and let me tell you, uh, let me tell you about this thing called, uh, uh, three card ante, and so he basically explains to her that she d- he doesn't think that if he were Diakaeus, that he would let the philosopher king come n- to the north, or he would just he would not put her on in somewhere that's obvious. They have to they're gonna have to find her somewhere that's not obvious, n- or they're gonna put her seemingly everywhere. So, um, and it was with the demon support and the help of this mysterious black king, they're prepared for the siege of the north. And then, uh, so the battle happens, there's like a whole airship battle, um, there's kind of a ground battle, and then, um, they make this, and then, uh, so, D- uh, Rio is on their only airship, he's summoned, he uses his, uh, his sword to summon the dragons, which is one of the things that it does, it's like its most powerful thing, um, uh, and they, so that's how they fight the enemy airships, um, and Diakaeus is like, okay, I guess it's time uh, to, uh, to reveal my secret power. So Diakaeus reveals that he mm, has the ability 
Uh, basically, it ba it's basically teleportation, but he calls it displacement, and it's the ability to basically put nothing in between himself and another location, and that's in fact how uh, New King works, is he teleports um, something into itself, uh, and that's the power he's given uh, the Philosopher King. So anyways, he, mm, he comes in, and he soundly defeats Riov, and he's like, listen, and Riov is like, oh shit, so this guy can put, can teleport the Philosopher King anywhere, so we cannot win. Like, he can, we are not going to kill the Philosopher King because he can just move her wherever. And she's not here. She can just be here when he wants her to be. So that's not great. Um, so with that, Riev makes the choice to surrender. And um, Riev and Diakase is like, great, glad that we didn't have to nuke anything. Sorry that we had to have a whole fight. Th glad you made intelligent decisions at the end. So Riev um, uh, manages to surrender for real. He puts on them a much worse piece of uh, negotiation, because, like, you know, they just tried to you, start a rebellion, and it didn't work. Um, Arlisair loses her mind. She, like, tries to kill him and stuff. Um, and he's like, okay, Arlisair, I see how it's gonna be. Let me get off of your deal. I will stop... I will... Uh, you're gonna just actually surrender for real, for real if you... Uh, if... If I can beat you in a one-on-one -on -one fight. If you can kill me, I will let... I, I'll let the North walk. They can do whatever they want. And she's like, seriously? And he's like, yeah, seriously, let's go. Um, and so they fight. He d uses his teleport stuff um, and, like, soundly wins. Uh, the princess, Sigursa, is, like, super traumatized. She's, like, watching, and she's, like, super traumatized by this because Ar she really admires Arla Ser. Um And he's like, cool, so since I defeated you, um, I'm gonna, like, I'm taking ownership of your house and you are coming with me personally, because I'm not letting you, like, do all this nonsense or start another rebellion again. Um, and, uh, so Arlisar is, like, locked in solitary confinement where she can't talk to other people since she was the instigator of the rebellion last time. And, um, oh, and Rhea is, like, super injured. Like, Diakaeus puts teleports him onto his own sword that was just really hot because it summoned dragons. So he's, like, you know, got this giant gap gate gaping wound in his side now, so he is out for the count. He cannot fight anymore. Um, Arlisair is, you know, in prison. Um, Diakaeus promptly goes about trying to, rem using his superior medical technology to remove her burn marks, and because it's, like, painful for her, so he's, like, doing cosmetic surgery on her, and she's not having a good time. Um, and at some point, she manages to, uh, get out to, um, try to kill him, and she re and she finds that he's, uh, in, that, uh, Lucian's already, like, trying to sleep with him, and she's, like, super pissed about this. Uh, he takes this opportunity to reveal that, like, in fact, yes, in fact, uh, the Gil did betray the North, and, like, ruin Gil's, basically ruin his, um, reputation so that Arlisair doesn't have anything else to stand on. Mm, and Lucienne didn't know this, so she's, like, kind of broken up over it. Um, so, yeah, and then that's the end of arc one, with, uh, Thule Fallen and Arlisair, um, being taken prisoner, and, um, and, uh, everyone already making plans for how they're gonna act in the future, but that's the end. Um, whew, that was a lot more than I thought. Oh my god, I don't know, this video is gonna be a lot longer than I thought. Alright, buckle up, guys, because it's time for arc two. So, Arc 2 begins um, with Arlisair coming to Diakaeus' home for the first time to Lethens. It's this beautiful marble city. Um, everyone's cheering and welcoming them home as war heroes. Mm, and um, the uh, Philosopher King comes down and gives a speech, and she's this gorgeous like doll-like puppet with silvery white hair. Mm, and she has like these perfect, mm, uh, you know, doll-like mannerisms. She's just you know, she's just stunning. And she gives this beautiful little speech, and um, Arlisair thinks about killing her, and then doesn't, because Arlisair is like, I... But in so doing, in realizing that she could kill her, Arlisair sort of, like, finds new purpose in what she wants to do. She's like, okay, I wasn't able to, like, save my city, but you know what I can do? I can kill the Philosopher King. Uh, no one else, they can, they can mount a better resistance in the future. Um, Diakaeus introduces her to, 
uh, this priestess lady who is going, who's supposed to like be in charge of Arlo Sayers, um, like citizenship, uh, edu education, and like uh, getting her like acclimated and stuff. And her name's Neralise, and Neralise is this very lov lovely lady, very kind. Um, and Arlo Sayers like, wow, th this person sucks. I hate you. Uh, so that's cool. Um, uh, the release manages to convince Arla Serre that, um, she should give up, uh, or she should let Diakaeus, um, have a little, the operation to, like, fix her skin, because, not because for, like, aesthetic reasons, but because it causes her a lot of pain, and also eventually, like, fix her voice. Uh, because it's really painful for her to speak. So they start with the skin and stuff. Arlisar knows this is just actually making her a, uh, you know, a symbol. This has nothing to do with her. Um, but she's like, sure, fine, whatever. Um, meanwhile, um, in the north, uh, Riev is having an existential crisis. He's like, I was told that I was going to be the person who was going to bring peace to the north, and I didn't succeed at doing that, really. I, like, I surrendered. The north is gone. Like, what am I going to do? Um... Lucien's like, you're such a fucking baby, uh, you gotta, like, stop being depressed and figure out what it is you want to do, because you could do anything now. Um, and, uh, something she points out to him is that in the South, they have, like, separate, um, designations for, like, colonies versus, um, what do you call it, versus, like, uh, proper, um, like, cities that belong to the after Gratoria. and colonies have a lot more auto autonomy they can like do whatever they want as long as they like send some money back and she's like why don't we just do that and why don't we figure out like if the war didn't work let's find another way to have independence and he's like you know what you're right okay well you need to go south and convince them to uh let us become a colony i guess and she's like yep sounds good so lucian then heads south uh along um and she doesn't show up for a really long time now uh, but, so that's basically the, what's happening in the north. Uh, meanwhile, um, Arlisar is, starts meeting other Telethenians, um, and she meets this Inquisitor, who's like, are you sure your Diakaeus is treating you okay? And she's like, yep, because she's nervous that if she says that she wants to go somewhere else, that he's not treating her well, that whoever gets her next will treat her even worse. So she's like, you know what? Fine. That's fine. Um, so, anyway... Um, uh-oh, I hope my screen didn't just get yellow on your end, because it just turned yellow for my nighttime. Um, that's fine. We're, we're rolling with it. We're gonna roll with the punches. It's fine. You'll live with it. it I hope you like yellow. Okay, it's cozy now, okay? It's cozy. <laughs> it's like the sunset. Um, so, anyway, uh, Arlo Serre mm, is called to testify before Congress, like the Senate floor, and to be like, hey, uh, you know, what are we doing with her? Like, Diakaeus, you can't just, like, keep her. She's a war criminal. And he's like, yeah, I can. I would like, in fact, I would like to adopt her mm, so that she can legally become a citizen. And this is sort of, a, like, a, a thing in their citizenship. So, um, technically, so conquered people have their own way of becoming citizens, but they're like, she needs to, like, be in jail or whatever. Uh, so technically she can't, and because when you're not a citizen of the Atricatoria, they don't need to treat you fairly. So he sort of adopts her to ensure that they do treat, give her, like, a fair shot. Mm, and he's like, listen, when she was a war, she did war crimes because she was told she was supposed to do war crimes. It's fine. Uh, she's allowed to do whatever she wants now. Mm, and, and by that, I mean she's allowed to become a citizen and, like, become, a, like, a good person now. And everyone's like, I don't know about that, but okay. Uh, so basically he, mm, he does some shenanigans to get people to do what he wants, and he's like, oh yeah, Arlis is gonna become a little citizen, it's gonna be so great. Problem is, to have this meeting with Congress, he took her in to the Ivory Tower, which is um, where uh, Calliopeia, the Philosopher King, the person who can do the nukes, lives. So Arlisar has fucking snuck off to the top of it. Uh, oh, I've missed a bunch of stuff, but there's like, mm, up until this point, they have like some like kind of uh, like, some shenanigans stuff, like, where she helps him, uh, handle a bunch of, a ship that's come down from the north that have these things called Flavo Knight on them, they're void beasts, um, and she's, like, doing all this stuff to try to convince them that she actually is genuinely willing to change, so that's, like, one of them where she, like, helps him out with that. Another point where she's, like, um, like, uh, when he's, 
like talking to, about uh, Solvang and like Solvang's like, hey, kids, how did you get out this mysterious teleporting power? That's kind of sus. Uh, that's kind of that seems kind of demonic. And he, Diakis is like, nope, it's not demonic. I promise. And he's like, I don't know. I'm gonna observe you. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, in uh, so anyway, so she's gotten all the stuff to win his trust. So it's kind of actually by this point. So by so when she goes up and tries to kill Calliopeia, he's like surprised by this. Um, so she goes up to stab Calliopeia. Calliopeia is like, oh, I'm not very surprised that you want to do this, but I wish you wouldn't. And Arla is like, I'm gonna. And then she's like, well, surprise, I also have teleportation powers, so you're probably not gonna be able to do it. And then who should show up? but Gil, and it turns out that Gil is not dead. Well, he is. He's been made into a flesh golem. His body has been, like, restrung up with East wires, so, mm, and connected to his brain and stuff, so he still has all his memories, and he's like, wow, Arlisar, I, like, loved you and stuff. Why are you trying to kill the Philosopher King? And she, like, loses her mind that her, like, superior officer is here talking to her and stuff. Um, and it just like really messes with her, and so he and our, um, Di and so he manages to delay her long enough that Diakaius comes up and subdues her, and he's like, I just fucking went to a trial to talk about how you weren't dangerous and how you're willing to, like, you know, uh, conform, and now here you are trying to assassinate the head of state and also my daughter. That's pretty fucked up. So he, um, but because she's like super traumatized now because of Gil, she like shuts down, um, She's like, maybe I should just, like, kill myself or whatever, because I'm not- this was not the right choice, I don't know what I want to do anymore, I'm not having a good time. Um, I'm far, uh, by the way, mm, uh, who, you know, she saved from being kidnapped, comes down to repay the favor and save her. He, like, sneaks into the room and he's like, hey, let's go, and she's like, what's the point? Like, I've- I've nothing to live for now. Um, and he's like, oh, uh-oh, they got to her, wee-woo. Um, and then Diakaius walks in and is like, excuse me, and he starts beating the shit out of Imvar. Um, and Arlissa is like, no, 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 stop, because she realizes she does actually have something she cares about. She cares about him, she cares about Sigirsa, who's, like, with him, and, uh, she's like, stop, I will, okay, I'll conform for real, don't hurt him, like, stop. And Diakaius is like, you sure about that? And he's, she's like, yes, I promise, I'll be a good little daughter, I will genuinely try to conform, I'll genuinely try to find peace, Please don't beat him up. And he's like, all right. So he lets mm, Imvar go. And Imvar is like destroyed by this because, okay, so I need to rework his arc to be better. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, but mm, I want him to have this arc where he like is kind of this overprotective sort of parent figure because his own kids uh, his, or his previously adopted, he doesn't have his own kids, but his previously adopted kids died. Mm, and so he see he saw Gil and Arlisar as like, his second chance to be a good father, and then Gil died, and then Arlisar got kidnapped. So the fact that she's, like, picking this other father figure who was, like, terrible to her is, like, destroys him. So he goes to his darkest night of the soul, or whatever it's called, um, and Arlisar is like, okay, I'm pretending to be, like, a good person now, and she, uh, talks to, like, Neuralise, and Neuralise is like, I'm so proud of you for trying to change, um, and they've had this sort of, like, kind of, like, romantic chemistry up until now, so, um, they, like, actually kiss for the first time, and Arlisar is like, I'm on a good path, um, and then they go, uh, to, they, so then, um, as, so, in the background of our, all of this, Diakaius has been, um, being questioned by the Inquisition, because it turns out there's, like, a demon rising problem in, uh, Telethans. There's been an increase of demonic activity, so he's like, all right, well, since the Inquisition's already on my back, I'm gonna go give a little speech and being like, hey, everybody, look out for signs of devils, um, just to show that I'm, or demons, just to show that I'm, like, not a threat, right, that I'm, like, on their side. And he takes Arlisar and Neuralise, and lo and behold, Demons come and attack, except for the fact that they aren't anything like demons, the demons that you've met so far. They're like these weird abominations that start calcifying people and turning them to bone. And Neuralise gets turned into bone right in front of Arlisar, and is like, oh my god, like, this person that I just connected with, that I just said I was willing to open my heart to, just died in front of me again. Like, I'm so fucking cursed, and she's like, mm, like, I... Th this is- what is- am I doing? Like, this is too much, and so she just sort of sits down and decides that she's going to, you know, give up on life. And so she gets hit in the head with one of these calcification things, but she doesn't die. She s wakes up 
in the abyss. And we haven't talked that much about the abyss. The, I don't think. I don't know. I've done this in multiple recording in multiple parts now, so I don't know if I've said it before. But the abyss is the source of all the world's magic. It's like the layer underneath the world. It's made entirely of ice. And she wakes up there and she's like, "Oh my god, where am I?" And suddenly, like millions of eyes open up and they're like looking at her and that they're the eyes of all the mages that have like removed their eyes to gain magic and the release transforms in front of her into the god of chaos and magic and like the underworld named eris and eris like like the fourth wall is broken she like talks in the narration it's like a super cool moment um i'm i'm uh, pretty proud of that one uh, but anyway, so she, mm, she like, talks to Arliss there, and it's like, if you become my next champion, I'll save you. I'll, like, let you, mm, I'll take care of you, and I'll uh, make sure that, like, you know, you can get revenge on on the city. You can destroy this city for me, um, because Eris has a thing. Now, Eris's motivation is basically to, like, get at her sister who runs the Inquisition and the church here. Um, I haven't talked much about her, but that's definitely a thing that exists. Um, the Inquisition that's been investigating Diakaeus, that's, um, that's all run by her sister Yulia. So Eris is like, hey, I'll help you, um, uh, destroy the city, because that's what you want. I'll help you kill, get revenge on all these people who hurt you. And Arliss are, in this moment, being totally freaked out, and despite having lost everything, realizes that she does not want to destroy everyone. She, she does, she wants to protect people, and if... And she also sort of has this realization that Diakaeus is being, like, taken advantage of by this release lady. Um, and so she's like, no, I don't want to die. I want to protect people. Um, so Nerlis is like, hmm, fine, suit yourself. So she sends Arlisser back to the real world untouched. And Arlisser, like, protects these people for real, for real. Like, it's not an act anymore. She genuinely wants to help them. So she protects them against the... Um, the, like, at the calcification bomber people, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna drink water. So she protects them, and, um, she meets Yulia, the opposing force, um, she's, like, trying to tell people that, like, she saw that, uh, that, like, Diakasis' powers do actually come from the abyss and stuff, and Diakasis is like, haha, she's just, like, got hit in the head or whatever, and he takes her home and he's like, hey, don't talk about that, that's weird, and she's like, hey, did you know that I just talked to the goddess of the abyss and she says that she's, like, using you to, like, destroy the world and she's gonna discard you as soon as you're not interesting anymore? Like, she just tried to do that. She tried to give your power to me, and that's kind of messed up. And Diakase is like, oh, I know, but I'm not that concerned about it. Mm -hmm. She's fine. And Arliss is like, no, she's not fine. She's a problem, Diakase. She's a huge problem. Diakase is like, you need to relax. She's fine. She's on our side. And Arliss is like, oh, no. And what Arlisair sort of realizes is that Diakaeus is being used in the same way that she's be was being used by, like, Gil and House of Agony and stuff, and how they, like, got rid of her when they were done with her, or they tried to. And so she wants to do the same for Diakaeus now, because she's, like, this, like, deathly, this, this experience of dying and coming back to life has made her realize that she wants to try to help people, and she isn't interested in getting revenge or anything like that, because she people are important basically she's realized like how important her life is and so um she has this um however Nerlis, or in the form of Nerlis, eris is still here and she's just like hee hee what are you gonna do about me and arlis is like well i'm gonna figure out how to stop you one way or another and that is the end of arc two arc two is much much shorter as you can see uh than arc one um we uh, have a brief interlude in between Arc 2 and Arc 3 where I was, like, trying to write, like, stuff from not Arlissa's perspective, but then I didn't really succeed um, in finishing that. But there's, like, this sort of pseudo-arc here where this blood cultist from the southern demons that are, like, invading the- that are, like, you know, doing the southern incursion um, meets this Tsar, and they, like, fall in love. Um, and she, like, leaves her cult for the Tsar, and they, like, try to kill the demon king in the south, but they can't, because it turns out the Demon King of the South is, like, a god, um, and, um, another group of people is that the interlude focus would focus on, if it was, like, properly written, is, um, the Inquisitor Triumvirate that I've made, um, Zalathiel, Nessa, and Seravanya. So, Zalathiel and Nessa are, uh, well, Zalathiel is a Telethenian who lives in another city named Zavlakia. It's kind of like the New York of the South. Mm, and um, 
he uh, is would like he thinks that the Inquisition isn't effective enough at dealing with the demons, and so he wants to become the head of it to fix it. Um, Nessa is his uh, one of his significant others, and she basically believes in him. Um, and also, the other thing for Nessa also is that she was taken into the Inquisition as a child and uh, can't leave because she was like inquisited because she, similarly to the other girl I mentioned way way earlier. Uh, she ate yeast crystals as a child, and so now she has, like, weird powers that when she was younger were way more out of control, but now they're in control, and she was, so she would like to leave the Inquisition now. But the current head of the Inquisition won't let her leave, so she uh, is wants to work with uh, Zalathiel to get him to be the head, so he'll let her go. Um, and they encounter this demon who is frozen in ice, or in, like, an East Glacier, and... Uh, She's like 2,000 years old, and it turns out that she's, um, you know, she's, uh, she was supposed to seal away the Demon King, and the reason, and, but he's not in the seal with her, so she realizes that he must have gotten out. So, um, and D Zalathiel puts that together with, like, the ineffectiveness of the, the Inquisition to realize, oh, that's what's happening, is the Demon King is, like, rising again, and we have to stop him. So, um, they end up. Uh, so they have this sort of enemies to lovers arc. She, uh, Sarah, Sarah Vanya, the demon from the glacier, ends up falling in love with Nessa first, and Nessa's, mm, and Nessa and her, like, become an item. It's super cute. Um, but then, uh, uh, but Zalathiel's still really untrusting of her, and they kind of butt heads a lot, um, until one day, um, she, uh, the day that he's, like, supposed to present her to the other Inquisitors to be like, okay, we definitely shouldn't kill her, we definitely should just keep her around, um, she doesn't come on time, and so he goes and is like, what, why did you miss the most important meeting we have? And it turns, and she's, like, asleep, and has, and she and Nessa have, like, bite marks on, the, well, Nessa has bite marks on her, and, um, so, uh, and so he, like, thinks that she bit her, and so he tries to give her to his, um, his, like, uh, one of his, like, mad scientist sort of illuminator people who, will, mm, but it turns out, actually, she didn't bite her. They were, like, both drugged and stuff, and he, and Zalanthi was like, oh, interesting, I don't have any time for people trying to backstab me because I am interested, because I need to become the Inquisitor General. And so he, like, does some backstabbing, and they, like, po politic their way to power. It's very cute. Um, but, uh, uh at some point, Saravanya tells Nessa, like, hey, I'd really like to get married. I know it's illegal now, but, like, maybe we could just do it symbolically. And Nessa's like, oh, I don't want to commit to anything like that. And so Seraphania is, like, destroyed by this. Um, and so she and Zal end up getting married instead because Zal's like, is the issue that you just want to commit your life to someone? Because you can just commit your life to me. That's fine. And she's like, what? And you're just going to do that? And he's like, yeah. And during this, she reveals she has the power to, like, bind people to their word into contracts. And so he's like, sure, sounds cool. I'll get married to you. You're pretty cute. Um, and she's like, you're nuts. And he's like, well, the contract's going to make it so that I can't do anything else. So, like, let's let's do this. Um, and it also extends, and because, like, in their marriage vows, she puts, like, all that is mine is yours and all that is yours and my, is mine and stuff, they, uh, he also manages to get this power. So that's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's, mm, uh, and with that, um, they, uh, get themselves reassigned to Telethans, where the, uh, um, current Inquisitor General is, and they're like, all right, let's work our way to the top. All right. Arc 3! If you've gotten this far, uh, congratulations, thank you so much, uh, but definitely I've recorded this, uh, video over multiple days, uh, with, uh, you know, multiple, uh, over, like, a lot of different days, and I've taken big breaks between them, and so I don't always know if I'm being coherent or not, so absolutely, if you have a question, leave a comment. You know, the world letters originally were intended to be written to my friends as like, here's the plot, here's the story that happens in my brain every night before I go to bed. And then I would like tell them about the world building separately, like outside of that. So while I've been working more recently and making these like more for public consumption more recently, um, for the vast history of them, like basically up until this point, world letters were written with my friends in mind first where the author wasn't dead. It was this more sort of performance art element um, where you like interacted with the author. So um, 
Uh, basically, I guess I'm saying that if you have questions or something, let me know. Uh, if you have ideas also, or if you have things that you think you, you would have done differently, uh, tell me. Like, definitely leave all of that in the comment. I'm totally open to criticism. Um, but yeah. Alright, let's launch into Act 3. Act 3 begins with Arlacer being like, okay, I have to get to see the Cirrus and tell her that uh, her sister Eris is here and is about to cause problems. Um, and uh, and so she's like, I'm gonna just like get out of the house. And Diakaeus is like, you can't leave the house um, without me and also without a sash. Like, just wait until you have your sash, okay? Uh, and he... But then he dips to go north, and he doesn't wear his sash to do that. And so Arlacer just takes it and uh, steals off with it. Uh, meanwhile, he goes to see Princess Gavina, the eldest princess of the demons. Uh, because he, if you recall, she, he has this sort of special relationship with her, where they've sort of traded uh, information back and forth, and uh, just sort of gambled about whether it was going to get them anything or not. Um, so he goes to meet her, she's pissed, because she's like, I can't believe that you turned me against my family, uh, and made me, like, attack our allies, and, like, Arlacer, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, but listen, we're gonna nuke you if you don't, um, like, t surrender immediately. We already don't like demons very much in the South, but, like, you should just surrender, you don't have, and she's like, oh, I'm not in charge, my brother's in charge. Um, I don't think I've gotten into this too much. Uh, Gavina, mm, so, the way the demon hierarchy works is that uh, the demon king has a queen, and then he has as many other, like, wives as he wants, but he has to have a designated queen because it's her children that are going to be the heirs to the throne, and this way there isn't infighting. Um, but Gavina, despite being the oldest, uh, it's not that she's- so she's the oldest, but it doesn't have anything to do with her gender because demons can just switch both their gender and their sex whenever they want without any repercussions because they're shapeshifters, um, so their society doesn't even really, like, care about that. Uh, but they do care that she is the daughter of the head consort, not the queen. So she's not supposed to, like, um, she really shouldn't have been born first, technically speaking, because if he's supposed to pick his queen as, like, his favorite person, um, but he didn't. So, anyway. Uh, so, uh, the, so his son mm, is, and her brother is the current demon king after the last one, uh, died. Um, and she's... Uh, and she's really sad about that, and, um, so Diakaeus is, um, uh, like, is like, listen, I've got a problem with my demons in the south, uh, and you have a problem where you want to get on your throne. Let's make a deal where I'll help you navigate politics if you help me with my demon problem. And she's like, alright, deal. Uh, and she's like, but to prove, one of the things you can do to help me out, because you're a really high-ranking person, uh, if I can drink your blood in public somewhere, That'll make me look really good. And he's like, okay, I guess. Um, so she takes him back south, um, and then they, uh, she like drinks his blood, blood in public, it's a whole thing. Um, uh, meanwhile, Arlacer gets to the Cirrus, and the Cirrus is like, mm, I've been expecting you, I can see the future and stuff. Mm, and mm, Arlacer's like, yeah, your sister's here. And she's like, oh, I know, she's always here. Uh, I can't really do anything about that, though. She can just do whatever she wants, because if I antagonize her, she will just destroy everything. And unfortunately, I care about everything, and she doesn't. So, um, I can't do anything. Sorry, haha. And Arlacer's like, wow, you're useless. And so, because mm, Arlacer's like, think it, talk and smack, um, the goddess is like, all right, Arlissa, you know why you suck? It's because you just suck up to whoever happens to be in power at the moment, and you don't have any unique thoughts. Um, but you'd be much happier if you just, like, stop trying to be an independent person. And Arlissa is like, Christ, what, why are you, why are you attacking me like this? Um, so anyways, uh, then, uh, Diakaeus and, um, Gavina teleport in, and, um, they're in the Ecclesia, and the Ecclesia Shrine is, like, um, the Ecclesia in, isn't just, like, the modern, uh, like, big Christian church or whatever, where it's, like, you go in and you pray and that's it. They are mostly, like, 90% of the reason people go there is for healthcare, and also for, like, therapy and counseling. Um, because, uh, and also for, uh, because it's, like, it's free. But also for, um, um, what's the other thing? Uh... Magic stuff. If you have a problem with magic, um, like you have magical animals attacking your farm or something, or um, you got cursed by a witch or something, uh, you come. And by the way, witches are just like the southern word for mages. In the north, they're called uh, 
um, mages or sages, depending on if you're Thulian or um, Sagan. And in the south, they're called um, witches and uh or mages if you're Telethanian. Uh, basically, cultural words, it's all the same thing, though. Um, so anyways, if, like, a witch got mad at you or something, you can go to the church and they'll be like, okay, uh, witches shouldn't be using their magic to commit crimes or whatever. So, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of people here, and so that's why it's actually, and it, there's always a lot of people here, so that's why it's a really good place for Gavina to just drink Dicase's blood in a place that's super public. Um, and so Arlazer, like, goes up to try to save him, uh, and, um, but then, a bunch of the demon cultists from, uh, uh, the ones that were throwing the bones, um, the calcification bombs and stuff, like, burst in and start doing the same thing, and Gavina, like, has to help fight them back, Diakaeus teleports her out, um, before the Cirrus can, like, really, like, see in person, and the Cirrus starts, like, blasting them with magic powers, um, and then Diakaeus takes Arlisar home, uh, when everything sort of settles down. Uh, the thing is, is that Arlisar, at this point, she's wearing his sash, and he's like, I, you have to stop doing this. Like, stop trying to help, because you're just getting in the way. You're, you can't just steal my stuff. Also, that's, like, illegal. You would have gotten in so much trouble if you'd gotten into trouble. Um, yeah. And it also would have been in my name. So he's just not thrilled. And she's like, I'm trying to save you. And he's like, I don't need you to save me. I need you to, like, calm down. Um, and so he sends her back to her room. Where Eris, in the form of Neralise, the priestess, is, and Neralise is like, hee hee, wow, you fucking suck, Arlisar. And Arlisar uh, just loses her shit, and because she's realized that she's a goddess now, she just starts beating the crap out of her. She just, like, throws her into the ground, she starts just, like, pounding her head into it. And then she realizes that, uh, like, um, Eris is not a real human being, so it doesn't matter, like, if she can't hurt her. And so she sort of calm, she mellows out, um... And, uh, Eris is like, wow, did that make you feel better? And Arliss is like, no, it didn't. Um, and Eris is like, what's, what's wrong? And Arliss is like, everything's wrong because nobody cares about me. And it's so hard. Like, it's so hard to not have anyone who genuinely cares about me. And maybe never did. And Eris is like, okay, I know how to get people to care about you. And, um, you know the one Tumblr post that's like, if a bunch of ants were chanting your name... Uh, you would become, like, their Cthulhu god, and, like, if one of them asked you to make them fall in love with another ant, mm, uh, you would, like, kill all the other ants because you can't, like, manipulate ant emotions. Well, the Eris is the same way. Eris can't manipulate ant emotions or human emotions. So she just, she's like, okay, Arlisar, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cause a problem, and you're the only one who can stop it. I'm gonna go meet me at the ivory tower at midnight, and Arlisar's like, oh no. Uh, so Arlisar goes to try to get Diakaeus, but he's not hit in. He has a social life, so he's, like, he's out for the night. Um, so Arlisar, uh, grabs a kitchen knife and sneaks out, like, uh, once again, um, to go, uh, to go deal with this. Some people, some guards, like, question her, and they're like, I don't know about that, and where, where are you going? And she's like, I need you all to evacuate the ivory tower now. And they're like, I don't believe you. And she's like, well, then I'm about to become the reason that you need to evacuate the ivory tower then. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then, Eris... Uh, shows up, and she opens up this huge, uh, like, path to the abyss, and this terrible, like, multi-hand abomination thing, like, pours out, and it's like, it's like this, like, slug beast made of, like, a thousand hands, and it starts trying to, like, eat all the people in the square, and, but specifically it's going after Arlisar, so Arlisar is, like, the only one, also seems to be the only one who can, like, actually hurt it, um, because that's how Eris designed it. Um, however, Calliopeia, since she lives in the top of the tower, starts attacking it. Um, she teleports Arlisar out of there, um, and anyone else, you know, and Arlisar is like, hey, I, only I can destroy it, and Calliopeia is like, well, I'm a weapon, aim me. So Arlisar, um, like, shoots, a, like, a thing of fire at it, um, and it explodes, and it sort of has this chain reaction where a bunch of, where everything else Mm, like, abyssal in the area starts exploding, and then Calliope- but Calliopeia has a hand from the abyss, like, her, one of her- her- or her- her fing- one of her fingers is from the abyss, this is how she does the teleportation thing that Diakaeus does, mm, and so it starts, like, uh, making her, like, arm, like, vibrate, and so Arthur sort of chops it off because she sees what's about to happen, and Calliopeia, um, since she's a computer, she needs that to think clearly and to, like, make processing decisions. Mm, and so she sees that it's still, but it's still, like, vibrating. So 
she kicks it off, but Arlesire's in the way, so she kicks Arlesire and her hand off of the tower into the monster below. And so Arlesire's, like, you know, plummeting into the abyss again. Um, because, mm-hmm. like, you mm-hmm. can't, like, take, like, if you took, like, a corner out of your laptop, for example, it would not work very good. Like, a, that that's, even though, like, you can take, like, a hand off of a human, it's fine. Her ram is in all parts of her body, so, like, it's a, it's a whole thing. So anyway, that's not good. Um, Diakaeus shows up and starts teleporting people out of the tower. He gets Calliopeia out of the tower and is like, what, what the heck just happened? Calliopeia explains. Um, at first, Diakaeus is like, I can't believe, like, Arliss is, like, trying to chop her hand off. And then she's like, no, 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 she did it to save me. And then I kicked her into the thing. And Diakaeus is like, oh, well, that's not great, is it? Um, so, yeah, so he, like, starts focusing on evacuating. Um... I mentioned uh, the people from the interlude, uh, Z- the Inquisitor Triumvirate, Zalathiel, um, Seraphania, and Nessa show up, and the Inquisitor General is not here, it's just them. And so, uh, Zalathiel, uh, so, when the thing blows up, it, the tower starts to fall. Like, it, the whole thing starts falling down. So, uh, Seraphania has, uses her, like, back tendril telekinesis powers that she has, and she, like, catches it. Um, Nessa... Uh, starts, like, starting a trios thing in the basement, and Zalathiel starts organizing evacuations of all the surrounding areas so they can set the tower down safely. Um, uh, Yulia comes out and is, like, trying to fight the abominations, because, it because like, the big abomination, like, broke up into a bunch of smaller, sluggy abomination things, and so Yulia mm, is, like, trying to destroy them, but they, like, get into her first, and they start, like, infecting her, like, burrowing in her skin. It's, like, terrible. Um, and, uh, mm, and so she, like, defeats most of them, but in, in, like, this burst of light, but then she collapses, um, and Zalathiel finishes evacuating everyone, and then he's like, alright, uh, I need you to put down the tower, and then the Inquisit- actual Inquisitor General shows up and goes, no, you can't do that, you'll damage a bunch of stuff, and Zalathiel's like, you're so stupid, like, we have no other options, and is like, about to drop it, because, like, she's got, like, a, mm, this, so, so it's revealed later that she's, um, a champion of the Abyss 2, kind of like what Diakaeus is, except for her power is different. Her power is the telekinesis tendrils, but it's, like, hurting her back. It's, like, there's, like, bits of the Abyss is, are, like, pouring into her back now. So she's, mm, she's, like, taking on all this damage. Um, she can't hold him much longer. So finally, Zelanathiel makes the call, just, like, put it down, don't listen to him. And so she does, and, um, uh, or she, like, drops it, and he... Uh, but it's, like, on top of them, so he and her and, uh, the Collapse mm, Sirius, they, like, book it out of there, but it, the tower falls and kills the current Inquisitor General, so he's dead, he's, like, he, they, and they don't even try to save him, they're, like, whatever, don't care. Um, and so with that, Zalanthiel's able to sort of take over the Inquisition, because he was, like, next in line, everyone thinks he's great, he just also, like, saved a bunch of people by taking over, because the Inquisitor General wasn't there, so, yeah. He's, mm, he's doing good, he's in a great position, um, and, uh, so he goes to talk to the Sirius afterwards, and, mm, she, and it becomes pretty clear, very quickly, that she can't, she's blind, she can't see anymore, uh, and not just, like, blind and, like, that I can't see what's in right in front of me sort of sense, um, more so she can't, um, she can't see the future anymore, uh, she's just, like, a normal human, uh, she can't see, like, all the, because, po- like, previously she could see, like, all the possibilities of all the different futures, and now she can't, um, so, but she's, like, trying to hide it, and he totally figures her out, um, so he was like, cool, so I am basically in charge of the church now, that's great, um, Arliss there, meanwhile, um, she's in, so, okay, 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 so with Arliss, so when Daddy Case is evacuating people out of the tower, um, he finds Arliss there, in the, like, one of the bodies of, like, the goop, one of the, like, goop bodies. So he, like, pulls her out. She's, like, throwing up and sobbing and, like, super traumatized. Uh, she apparently, like, can't see anything. So he takes her down, um, to Nessa and stuff to try to, like, take care of her. And they quickly figure out, basically, that she can't, um, she, like, isn't capable of perceiving anything or, like, being in her body unless she's in, like, physical contact with something else. Uh, but even so, she's like, starts fading really fast. She, like, goes into a coma. She's not doing good. Uh, so Diakaeus ends up going to, uh, Gavina and being like, hey, I need you to save her. Because demons have the power to shapeshift, um, uh, using their blood to shapeshift bodies to do other things. So he's like, you can heal her, right? Like, you can shapeshift her, 
her like internal organs or whatever to be better, right? Um, and she's like, okay, I, I can save her life, but a life for a life. Like, I don't just do this for free. Um, so Diakaeus agrees, and it's not clear what he exactly agrees to, to give her a life in exchange for Arliss Ares. Mm, so, um, and this sort of marks a turning point in the relationship, because he's just like, she's just like actually shown with her whole f body and whole heart that she's actually serious about changing this time. And he has just, and now she's gotten hurt because of it, and he's like putting something on the line for her. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know if I've already said this, but they basically have like a, in Seven Enemies to Lovers arc, they have an Enemies to Father Daughter arc. It's, it's very cute. I'm a big fan of it. Um, but anyway, uh, so, uh, she, uh, so because, uh, Gavina heals her, uh, she's able to wake up, but she still needs help, so Nessa decides to get her this, like, uh, so Nessa and Diakaeus arrange for her to have this, like, slug cat rabbit thing, um, like a, like a slug, a purple slug ocelot thing, and it just, like, sits on her head. It's very cute. And I also, at first, it's like, this thing's weird, but then it, like, you know, puts its little posies on her chest and goes, like, eep, and she's like, oh, okay, I'm in, I'm in, that's cute. Um, so, uh, she, uh, she take, so this creature sort of, like, allows her to, like, see and feel safe in her body, and, um, uh, yeah, and so then they start trying to apply some of these ideas to the other people who, like, fell into the creature or whatever, but, um, because they aren't healed by demons, they don't, most of them don't do very good, so that's kind of sad. Uh, but Diakaeus can't, like, reveal it, because then he would be like, well, you're working with demons that are literally in the enemy government, that's really cringe. Um, so anyway, um, uh, meanwhile... Uh, Arlissa, oh, Arlissa, while well, she's recovering, she manages, she sees Calliopeia, who's also been, like, in recovery, and she's, um, and who's been, like, getting her hand remodeled and stuff, and, uh, Calliopeia is, like, um, and she's, like, so Arlissa goes up and she talks about how when she was, well, okay, sorry, Calliopeia asks, like, why did you save me? And Arlissa is, like, well, I sometimes you have to do the things you don't want to do and she describes when she had a cat when she was younger um and uh how lucian's sisters um set it on fire and so then and she couldn't bring herself to kill mercy kill the cat afterwards because it was super damaged and wasn't gonna live um and someone else had to kill it and she said sometimes you just have to put down cats um and uh like, that's the necessary thing, so that's why I saved you. And Calliopeia is like, uh, and then, then I was like, you know, the reason that this whole thing happened is because your father has a deal with a devil or something, has a deal with Eris. And Calliopeia is like, what? He would never. And she's like, all right, suit yourself, whatever. You're going to end up like a cat or whatever. Um, and so, because she sees herself in Calliopeia and she doesn't like that because of lots of various reasons. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's a, so at this point, from this point forward, Calliopeia begins to sort of doubt Diakaeus and Eris and how loyal they are to her, so that's kind of a good, so that's a new dynamic that's developing. Um, and then, um, yeah, meanwhile, Zalathiel, now that he's in charge and has all the data, is like, this senator dude has been involved in all of the recent cases, like, all of the ones, everything, all of the, the like, calcification stuff, all of the bombings and stuff, that's all been him. So, uh, we need to investigate him. And specifically, he sends his younger sister to stalk him because she's, like, a delinquent who keeps getting in trouble. And so he's like, go, fine, here's a job, go follow the senator around. And meanwhile, Nessa, since she's in charge of Arlissa's medical care, has also been sort of told to start, like, uh, to, like, basically get as much information out of Arlissa as she can and get her to trust her. Um, so she sort of starts working on seducing Arlissa, and it works because Arlissa is, uh, you know, has sort of, like, I fell in love with the nurse who saved me um, stuff going on, so, yeah, um, <laughs> um, but then, uh, so, so they start working on trying to bef befriend Arlisair and get her to trust them, um, uh, Arlisair, meanwhile, like, when they get back, she and Diakaeus are, she's, like, super distraught over, like, having shown weakness and have dis disobeyed Diakaeus, and he's like, no, 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 you did good, I'm sorry I was being harsh before, like, let's, um, and so she can't sleep in her own room anymore, so she starts, 
um, like sleeping, sleeping in his, sleeping. I mean, it's an, okay, it's not a sex thing, but she starts sleeping like with him. So he, like, when she has nightmares and stuff, she wakes up and he can like hold her hand and stuff. It's really cute. Um, I'm a big fan. Um, anyway, uh, then okay, so he, mm, so that, uh. Sorry, since the last is like putting on pressure on Diakaius, Diakaius is like, okay, I have to figure out this demon thing. Um, oh, he also, mm, after the tower collapsed, he went to Eris and he was like, hey, um, you just, I know you're this, is, you did this for me because you want me to be entertained, but you just endangered both my daughters and that crossed a line. I never want to see you again. So he kicks her out of the city. Mm, uh, she's super, like, upset about that. And he's like, mm, understandable. Um, uh, but anyway, so he's like, I need to figure out this problem quickly, because he knows that it's not him. Um, and he knows it's a thing that Eris has set up for him. So he, um, goes, and, uh, I've, I've actually done some little bit more writing now, um, where there's, like, more backstory on how this works, but basically, he and Arliss are figure out that there is a place called the Seventh Star. It's this tavern where, um, the demon problem is based. So they go to investigate that. But Arlisar gets drugged there, so Diakis has to, like, save her. Um, and, uh, and then he points out to the Inquisitors, Hey, there's a, there's a thing at the Seventh Star, you gotta go do something about it. And Sarah Vanya goes there, and she realizes that that's the Demon King that she, like, was sealed away 2,000 years ago to stop. He's there, he's the one who, like, drugged Arlisar, but she realizes that she doesn't have the same powers as she did all those years ago, so she can't do anything about it, so he gets away, and he also learns that no one can do anything about him, so he can just do whatever he wants. Um, and she's, like, super upset about this, and she's like, oh man, I'm worthless, I can't do anything, like, I'm not, I'm not, like, a good person because I couldn't succeed at doing this one extremely difficult task. And so, uh, Zalathiel and Nessa have to be like, no, 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 we love you, it's okay. Um, but, like, that's her whole arc for this, like, thing. Um, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, um, Yulia, since she's never sight anymore, she's also like, oh my god, like, what is the good, what good is a goddess who can't see anything? Like, what, what is the point of, like, a godling who can't do anything? So she's having a whole time, she tries to manipulate Zalathiel into doing what she wants, but since he's kind of seen through her, he manages, mm, uh, he, like, just tries to kill her, and she doesn't foresee this, so... He's like, well, I see that you literally don't have your sight anymore. And so she's like, breaks down. She's like, super upset by this. And he goes, but he's kind of enamored by the fact that she's, you know, trying to put on a brave face and stuff. So he's like, so once she's vulnerable with him, he's like, all right, we're on the same side, but you have to back me up. You have to stop, like, futzing around here. Uh, the main reason he, like, goes and puts pressure on her is because since, um, even though Seraphonia is, like, all upset about things, he's like, Yulia is in charge of taking of this church, and she can see the future. Why is she letting this happen? So he, like, is really mean to her, and that's why he's trying to kill her, uh, to prove stuff. As opposed to, like, having a normal conversation with her. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then, um, with her in his back pocket, he's like, alright, well, now, next steps, work on Diakaius. And she's like, well, I think Diakaius is actually fine, like, he's harmless. And he's like, I don't know about that, like, you've been wrong in the past. And she's like, alright, well, admittedly, I haven't been able to see him as much lately, so I guess I'll fix, I, I guess you can go talk to Diakaius. So he actually doesn't go to Diakaius, he goes to meet Arlisair, because from everything he's heard from Nessa, Arlisair is, uh, starved for friendship and human connection. So he goes, and he's like, hey, by the way, I'm actually half Thulian, half Telethenian, so I'd love to learn more about my Earth culture and stuff, and thank you so much for letting us study you and your condition and stuff. And she's like, someone who's paying attention to me? Actually, she knows that she's being used, but she kind of doesn't care because she's so desperate at this point. So, um, she's gonna need to get over that eventually. But yeah, so that's the start of the arc three. And from here... We haven't written anything else. We have to, everything is, else is up in the future. Um, my plans right now, I'm gonna have Arlisair and Lucien reunite when Lucien gets down here to talk to everyone about how they need to become a colony. Um, Diakaeus is gonna need to unite the Senate to, like, help and, like, uh, unite, um, the people to vote for him and stuff. But I want him to have a rival who's a senator named Sepestro who is in Kivik's pocket so that they can, like, um, you know, he has, like, resistance and stuff, uh, and I was thinking it could be cool if he doesn't get re-elected, actually. Like, he, um, he loses the le election or forfeits the election, but then he gains something else from doing that. I don't know. I think it could be a really cool, like, darkest moment for him. 
Um, I want to, oh, since the demons in the south, I realized, uh, since they can turn into humans flawlessly, unlike the demons in the north, uh, I want to have, like, Among Us, who's the imposter moments, um, uh, I also realized, so Arlo Sarah's a really good fighter, I would say she's one of the, like, best in certain circ circumstances. Like, if she gets to go first, she, she'll just kill you. She's like a rogue in, in, in uh, D&D, &D, uh, where if she gets to go first, she just does a ton of damage, um, and she's very fast. Um, but because she keeps fighting supernatural entities, uh, she doesn't, she has, hasn't gotten to win for a while. So I, and in the past, she's mostly only fought, fought goons. So blood cultists I mentioned before, I want her to get in a fight with her, her and win. So that we're reminded that Arlisa is actually a really good fighter. Rythras is also a really good fighter. She's like really good for her age. Um, she's also disabled, but she doesn't want that like stop her. Um, so that I think will be a really cool fight. Um... I want to do more with the demon family and explain their interactions and their, like, dynamics and stuff more with Gavina and stuff. Um, I want, oh, I want Diakaius and Gavina to go after the southern demon king, queen and, like, take her, take her down. And then when they do, Kivik, since he's, like, the southern demon king, he's, like, a demon god, he, like, loses it and starts doing his own version of nuking things. So then there's, like, this cold, whole cold war or whatever. Um, and then Eris will either make up with Diakaius or she'll go full on villain mode and there'll be this like low key divine war thing that happens. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't actually have the end end uh, planned out like 100% yet, but I'm working on it. I think it's going to be cool. Um, and I want it to be about like how. And one of the reasons I have so many different perspectives, by the way, is that something that's really important to me in my work is I want to show that it's not. that history isn't made by any one person. It's. Like, it's, like, the reason all of this is coming together isn't because of Arlisair or Diakaius or, like, you know, um, or the Inquisitor General or the head of the church or mm, Calliopeia. It's, it's the interactions between people that make history. So that's one of the reasons why I really like having all these perspectives. Um, and so there'll be this cool, like, uh, moment at the end where they'll all question, like, can we do this? Mm, um, and then they'll, like, come together as, like, a community and rally, like, the, 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 the country behind them and stuff, uh, and unite humanity together against, um, the evil gods or whatever, even the other demons, because, um, basically, because the demon god is, like, really self-entitled is basically sort of what's going on, and he thinks his, what he wants is more important than anybody else, and so that's why it's important that it's, like, the community of everybody is what wins against him. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing with, uh, this. And that brings us to the end for now. Elfine, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you're one of my friends who've gotten this far, hi. Uh, thank you for coming to understand what my world letters are all about. Now you're caught up and you can just read them from here on out. Yay! Um, for the rest of you, uh, I have a link to everything that's posted in the description, of course. And once again, if you have any questions or comments or suggestions on what this story should be like, I would love to hear it. I legitimately love discussing story structure and plot structure, and there have been so many times when I've read published work where I'm like, I wish the author had just asked me if this was okay. <laughs> I mean, obviously they don't know me, but like, you know, where I'm like, I wish I could just talk to you and be like, hey, this doesn't make any sense, and then they'd be like, you're right, it doesn't make any sense, and then we could have a conversation about it. So that's kind of why I guess I presented all this, is because I don't expect you all to read my, like, 250,000 words of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this. Um, so, yeah. Um, so thank you so much, and I will see you on the flippity-flap. <laughs>